Hello and welcome to this screencast on vertebrate evolution and diversity. In part one, we'll just look at fish and amphibians, and then in part two, we'll look at reptiles, mammals, uh, and birds. So just to begin, very generally, we are looking at the phylum of chordata. Remember phylum from our lesson on taxonomy. So you might be thinking, chordata, what is that? Well, chordate isn't any animal that has at some point in its lifetime, maybe not its adult form, but definitely in its embryonic form, would have um, four things. A dorsal hollow nerve cord, a notochord, which are two different things, pharyngeal pouches, and a tail that extends beyond the anus, also known as a post-anal tail. Um, about 96%, so almost all of the phylum of chordata are also vertebrates. So vertebrates are slightly different in that they have a distinct vertebral column or a backbone. Um, in vertebrates, this dorsal hollow nerve cord then is then called the spinal cord. So in the overall picture of life, we're looking at the phylum chordata and how it has evolved over time, especially in adapting to its environment. That's one thing we're going to focus on. Um, in this unit. So here's an example of a very early chordate and the four characteristics that it would have. Uh, dorsal uh, hollow nerve cord and then underneath of that is the notochord. Um, a tail, yes, when you were in the embryonic form you had a tail, you still do. Um, it's called your tailbone. And here are the pharyngeal gill slits. You also had those as an embryo. And here is a cladogram. Remember learning about cladograms back in the evolution unit of uh, chordates. And so down here we have our fish, which we'll learn about today. They evolved into amphibians, and we'll learn about those too. And then later on, reptiles and birds, and finally mammals. So fish. Fish are aquatic. I'm sure you already knew that. Most fish have paired fins, scales, and gills. Uh, earliest fish appeared 510 million years ago in the fossil record. And these fish were jawless. So we're going to learn about three different types of fish. The earliest type was jawless, and they were covered in bony plates. Um, but obviously, um, they evolved. They didn't stay that way. They eventually um, adapted to their environment. That's a key theme here. And they got jaws and paired fins. Well, you might want to ask yourself why. Why would they want jaws and paired fins? Well, the jaws especially were helpful um, with their muscles and the teeth and eating a, a wider variety of food, maybe starting to become predators. Um, and they were also able to defend themselves by biting. So here's a really good look at this uh, fossil with the teeth and the jaw. And paired fins probably just help them with mobility, probably help them be faster to um, escape predation. Um, so early on, they evolved into two major groups. Um, one group um, is the ancestors of modern sharks, and they were made out of cartilage. The skeleton was made out of cartilage. Um, and then the other group had a skeleton made out of bone. And so we'll take a closer look at those two groups, groups here in a second. Um, a couple things that I'm going to focus on throughout vertebrate evolution and diversity are respiration, uh, circulation, and reproduction, because those three systems really show evolution and adapting to the environment. Um, so fish, how do they respire? They use gills. They don't have lungs. Uh, they're in the water environment. So they have gills to exchange gases by pooling oxygen-rich water in through their mouths and pumping it over their gills and then pushing oxygen-poor water out through the openings in the sides of the pharynx. Um, and here's a picture of some gills there. So nice red gills. Um, and just sort of at a side, as a side note, it doesn't really have to do with the respiratory system, but many bony fish have an internal gas-filled organ called a swim bladder that helps them adjust their buoyancy in water. And so here's a, a picture of fish anatomy, and here's the swim bladder. Remember, they have a nerve cord. They are chordates. Um, what else do we have here? Here are their gills. Here's their heart. We're going to take a look at their heart in just a second. They do have a tiny liver. They do have a tiny stomach and intestines and gonads. Um, cloaca, that's something we'll talk about with the reproductive. That's a common reproductive opening, and amphibians also have that. So now the circulatory system. This is a great figure um, showing evolution of the heart. So on the left we have a fish heart. Very simple. It just has two chambers, one ventricle and one atrium. And what you notice right away is there's no separation there. There is mixing of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. So that's very, very important. No separation and there is mixing. We also call this single circulation because it does not, the blood does not travel back to the heart in between the pulmonary route, which would be like the lungs or the gills route, 
and, and the heart route. It just goes one single time um, from the heart uh, to the body and back, heart, body, and back. So there are the gill capillaries and there are the body capillaries. And we'll compare that later on with the um, amphibian heart and then to the mammal heart. So you'll see this one again, but definitely understand this is the most simple, only two chambers and um, a mixing um, of the blood, single circulation. Reproduction, again, we're still in the water. So fish rely 100% on the water. They have external fertilization, so the female will lay thousands or millions of eggs in the water, and the male would come and um, pour sperm over the egg. That would be external fertilization. And so here are some examples um, of fish eggs in the water. So I did say that there are three groups sort of, of, of modern fishes. The first group is sort of primitive, the jawless fish. So they have their ancestors way back in the first fish. They have no true teeth or jaws. Their skeletons are made of cartilage, and they lack a vertebra. So they wouldn't be considered um, a vertebrate, but they are chordate. And then sharks and their relatives, these are chondrichthys, and they are sharks, rays, skates, uh, sawfishes, and chimeras. So really what I want you to know about this is their skeleton is made out of cartilage. So those are your sharks. And then the second modern group is the, are the bony fish, osteichthys, and their skeletons are made out of, well, bone. Um, so almost all living bony fish are considered ray-finned fishes, and this just refers to their, um, their slender, bony spines, and here's an example of that, and this is, I think, just the common herring. So most fish that you're familiar with would be bony fish. All right, so that pretty much ends it for fish. All I really want you to know, you know, those three main groups know about reproduction and circulatory system and respiration. And now we're going to move into amphibians because, yes, way back hundreds and millions of years ago, fish did evolve into amphibians. They had some sort of land environment open up, an opportunity for them to go on to land, and they adapted and they turned into uh, amphibians. Well, some of them did, right, through natural selection. So an amphibian is a vertebrate that, with some exceptions, obviously there's always exceptions, they live in water as a larvae and on land as an adult. So we'll talk about metamorphosis. They breathe with lungs as an adult. So here's a new adaptation. They have moist skin, which they also use for respiration, and they do not have scales and claws. And so here are some amphibians. Amphibian evolution appeared 360 million years ago, and as they moved from water to land, they had to definitely adapt to their changing environment. So they had to figure out how to breathe air, and we'll see that they developed some lungs to do that. They had to protect themselves and their eggs from drying out. This is really key. There's no more water as an adult. There is no more water. What are they going to do? They have to figure out a way to protect their eggs. Um, and they have to support themselves against the pull of gravity, because as an adult, they're no longer fully surrounded by water. So they develop some, some structural adaptations such as limbs. Um, so let's just go over these real quick. So bones in the limbs and the limb girdles became stronger, permitting more efficient movement. The lungs and breathing tubes enabled them to breathe air as adults. And the sternum formed a bony shield to protect these new lungs um, and other internal organs. So here's this picture again. In the middle now is the amphibian heart. And this is a three-chambered heart, so we go from two to three chambers. This one has two atria and one ventricle. Now, this is partial mixing, right? Because we do have separation between these two atria, but not with the ventricle. So we do have some mixing of oxygen-poor and oxygen-rich blood. Now, this is called double circulation. We can see the difference, really, when we compare. It goes from the lungs to the heart and then to the body, then back to the heart to the lungs. So it's always coming back to the heart. Whereas in the fish, it didn't do that. It went straight from the gills to the body, heart, and all over again. So definitely understand the difference now. We're becoming more complex, right, because the amphibians have more needs as far as moving about on land. So they need better um, efficiency in their circulatory system, better pumping, so we have the double circulation, and more efficient with no, well, not as much, right, mixing of oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor. So respiration, they're no longer in the water, um, at least as an adult, so they don't need those gills, but they need something to breathe. Um, so they have they use lungs, and they also have some gas exchange uh, through their skin and the lining of the mouth. Now remember, of course, as a larvae in the water, they would have gills, but then they undergo metamorphosis, which takes us to our next slide. Um, adults are typically ready to breed in about one to two years, and frogs are again laid in external fertilization. So this is a key thing to remember. 
Yes, we did evolve and we adapted to land, but amphibians are really this transitional animal because part of their life cycle is still very relying on water, but part of their life cycle is relying on land. And fertilization is one of those parts that's still relying on water. So they undergo external fertilization in the water, just like fish do. We have these tadpoles develop in the water. They're able to swim in the water, but then they eventually turn into the land-dwelling uh, frogs that we are most familiar with. All right, last slide uh, Well, of amphibians. Groups of amphibians, we've got salam salamanders and newts characterized by long bodies and tails, four legs, um, usually living in moist woods. And so here are salamanders. Maybe some of you had those as pets. Frogs and toads, they can jump, long legs. Um, toads are a little bit different. They've got short legs. There's frog. And then Sicilians are maybe ones you're not familiar with. These are actually legless amphibians that live in water, and they can burrow in moist soil and sediment. And so that is a Sicilian. I just want to do a little preview of our frog day section that we're doing along with this unit. Next week we'll do the rat. Well, this week we're doing the frog. Um, so you're going to get your frog and you're going to get your pan and your scissors and you're going to lay him on his back and pin him down with pins. And the first cuts that you're going to make are going to be um, to just go straight up his belly and then in between his arms and in between his legs. And then what that's going to create are two flaps like a book. And so you just take apart the skin and you open up his skin, not the muscle layer quite yet, but just the skin, and then you can take some more pins and pin down the skin. And then you make those same exact cuts again. So you go just straight up the belly and then across in between the arms and across in between the legs, but this time you're just cutting the muscle now, um, which is a little bit thicker. And so you're going to be using scissors to do all this and not a scalpel. Um, and so then when you open up those flaps of muscle, you see his internal or her internal organs. Um, and so your dissection guide will take you through all this, but this is the heart and this is the liver. Um, the pancreas is really difficult to see because it's sort of embedded in the curvature of the stomach. So this is the stomach. Um, you have um, a main uh, vein there, and then intestines are underneath. So the dissection guide will take you through all of it. Um, it's, you're, it's going to first ask you to do some external anatomy and look at the eyes and the tympanic membrane and the mouth. Um, feel the skin, feel the... Um, the legs and the, and the feet, um, and then you'll finally open them up, and then eventually you'll take out all the organs so that you can see underneath, because underneath you're going to see the kidneys, um, and if you get a um, female, you're going to be able to see all of her eggs, and those are, those are real black. I should have put a picture up here, um, but I'll show you a picture in class. So it's going to be really exciting, and I hope that you're excited to dissect a frog.